Well, I graduated from a, from, a, from a business school in France. And uh, at that time, I think luxury was considered something a bit minor, a bit frivolous, and something that's not so interesting when you are kind of want to do a serious career. And so I was not considering that at all. Uh, another thing which also was, uh, at least in France at the, this period, is that you had a clear divide. So either you go for something basically scientific, which could be both either engineer school or business school or things that uh, we see you're supposed to do something rational, or you go for humanities or you go for art. And, uh, and the uh, curriculum were very different and there was no basically uh, bridges between this one. And so I didn't know what to do uh, in my, for my major. Um, and uh, I had a kind of more, I get a, a clear divide to think the part of my side, which is, uh, I don't know, for more uh, artistic, creative, and think that I like to write, I take photos, I like music, playing myself, but this is my for my hobbies. Because anyway, if I have to live from it, maybe I'm not talented enough to do that. But uh, Well, my music teacher told me, you can become professional, but if you want to live decently, maybe you should try something else. And so in some way, I came to business because I was not talented enough in art. So that's the way to put it. <laughs> so it was a plan B in some way. And, um, and on there, I started to, and I, I graduated, it was financial planning and budget controlling and uh, having a big part also about computer. And so my first job in Saint Cartier was IT and organization. So, but because anyway, I thought it was the central processes, something very rational to understand how the business worked. So that's where I started. And then I thought it would not be there for a long time because things are too irrational for me. I had started as business consultant outside and I thought these guys were too rational and too boring and especially in times of restructuring. So I moved to Cartier, and I thought it was just the opposite. These guys are too irrational. They are just so emotional. They go ups and down like this. It's tiring. So I would not stay there more than two years. And I stayed two years, and four years, and f 10 years, and 25 years, and of entire life. And what I found in all my different, different jobs and moves, that in fact, luxury is the perfect place and industry. If you have to combine, in fact, four different kind of intelligence, which is rational, creative, emotional, and social. And usually there are no real kind of uh, education that combines those four, uh, because you are either uh, going to, to drive competencies or creativity, but really all. But in luxury, we need to have all of those. In some ways, some part are more like the uh, art and entertainment industry. Some part are very close to, I see, the Hollywood business models and how to create something just for culture of entertainment, whether in a book publishing or films or such. And some are very, very rational. That can be fast-moving consumer goods. And, uh, and in some way, you always have to find something in between where both the part of business, culture, art, and creativity have to come together because we create things people don't need. So when we think they're only rational, say, why do rational people go and buy something expensive they don't need, but they like? Why do uh, financial investors, traders, you know, go and work like hell and make, uh, and when they make money, they will buy an expensive car they don't need to go to the office or an expensive watch or an expensive piece of jewelry? Because we come to kind of aspirations which are very deep inside us and we have to understand that. And understand the aspiration change depending on regions and countries and cultures and generation. And we to make those long lasting brand relevant, we have equally to have some business acumen sense of sociology, philosophy, and some part wisdom or ethics, and some other part lean to arts and creativity. And if we do that well, then the luxury can flourish. So I found, after all, that the best way to reconcile the different part of myself that were kind of a sensitive and one side and creative, and the other side more kind of business driven. And Yanina knows when we talk about figures, you know I talk about figures. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but when you talk about art, we talk about art. And when you talk about uh, sociology or when you talk about uh, concepts and, uh, and we talk about them, including etymology, including something you say, why in the world does French language these days doesn't have the word sustainability? They all come from Latin, but sustainability doesn't exist. Only negative, only insoutenable, only unbearable. And you say probably it means that French, when they think développement durable, they have given up the idea to make it sustainable. They just want to make it last as long as they can. Development durable means things that will last and they try to protect their past. 
while Anglo-Saxon with sustainability want to do something positive. So it shows that French are incurred in the past and don't want to see the future in a positive way. And that's part of the words, the words we use. So we're putting a research group with, uh, with some uh, students also trying to find and to, co to, to question the French Academy, say, why don't you want to put the words in part of vocabulary? Because it's very, very important questions of today. And the fact that language doesn't include it, meaning that no one uses it in daily words. Everyone talks about development durable, but maybe there is no development durable. Maybe we have to go to degrowth, deconsumption, so that we can be sustainable. And if something is lasting and not sustainable, we're really unbearable. So it means something. Words mean something. People mean something. And when they say something, they should mean it. Just as an example at the pre-introduction to say why luxury can be an interesting field, despite what we may think, that can combine business, science, uh, philosophy or humanities, and creativity. Meaning luxury is coming back to the ideal of the 18th century, that education should bring science, philosophy, and art, like Pascal or Da Vinci, and they were all that. The model was that. Combine the three. Before and after it was divided, they say, if you want to be efficient, divide science, humanities, and art, so that you can make education program, which would find from the beginning who is talented for what, and you grow them in that. But then you create divides that are not matching periods where you have significant change coming on all fronts. So, good period to work on the three of those. Thank you very much, Cyril, for this uh, intro. And in fact, I think that this intro demonstrates how uh, open-minded you are. And uh, I um, really, uh, on my opinion, on the uh, opinion of our team and the many people around the world, uh, you have very intelligent culture with a deep background and absolutely different spheres. And uh, I think this conversation will be uh, truly interesting. And I invite you to participate in the conversation. We can easily change the flow which, uh, of the conversation which we planned. So uh, react, uh, ask questions, uh, give your comments. Uh, uh, let's do it interactive. But of course, we prepared some um, questions uh, which we pre-selected before the session. And we tried to uh, split them uh, on several blocks. And uh, I propose to start um, with a little bit philosophical question uh, and uh, new normality in relation to our life and uh, to our business. So we all see that uh, the world is currently going through a major crisis uh, with a storm-like pace and uh, the unprecedented nature of this crisis uh, is changing our mindset and uh, in a very different uh, formats and the way we project ourselves uh, into the future is also different. So how you see that? What is your opinion on all this mindset shifting and uh, how we pr project ourselves to the future? So I say in some way this crisis is unprecedented, yes and no, uh, because it could have been f foreseen and uh, on the kind of global pandemic, uh, it was kind of known since the year 2000 that the risk was increasing after having the, uh, the, the SARS and the MERS, and then the uh, Bill Gates Foundation had uh, expressed it in 2016 that there was a major risk of, uh, of expanding pandemics because the number of cases where there was some mutation of virus from animals to human was growing, and with the global interconnection, this would probably come. So I say everyone has to be ready because it will come sometime. So it was unprecedented, yes and no, because in terms of... Uh, of uh, pandemics, it's not the first time humanity is facing, and since from 2000, there have been some major ones. So this could have been seen, but it was not seen. That's the first thing, not say it's pre unprecedented, but unprepared. Mm -hmm. Then there is also some, some work be done about crisis and how to face crisis. On the financial crisis, I think the government, central banks have learned from the Great Depression, and the way they handled the one thousand eight and nine was much more efficient than the one had been done before. So the know-how to this institution could face this was fine. But one, how to face a part where both health and economy can be impacted together. In fact, most government and countries were not prepared mentally. And it showed the same change in value. But some work done, by, and uh, there is, I recommend you to read the work of the Professor Taleb, uh, who has uh, written books about black swans, and another one called Anti-Fragility. And they say, well, 
we're probably in the work of increasing complexity, increasing interconnection, so this unprecedented event will come more and more frequently. We just have to have them in mind, and we must have something planned in our brain that makes us prepare for it. If we have been in a world too much of predictability, then we will be taken by surprise. But we should not think it's something that will not happen, it will happen more and more frequently. So what we should see from, uh, from what was said and, and, and on all these books in some way, that if we include crisis in our planning, then we can be fine. And if we see what each crisis tells us, it makes it helps us to get prepared for the next one in a better way. The problem is that often we, we, we learn very little and we forget very fast. So we get to the next one without being prepared and having not learned anything. So the change in mindset is say, let's learn from this one, so that we bet get better prepared for another one that will come. So that not think that we'll come to pre-COVID level as if nothing has happened, because the world has changed. Some part has changed in a way which are, I think, um, interesting, um, um, how should I put, in convergence and divergence at the same time, and something that can be both scary and both reassuring. Uh, we have seen a uh, government coming to very different kind of response and some uh, uh, stay in denial for a long time and trying to blame things on others, saying it's an uh, Asian problem, it's a Chinese virus, it will not reach to Brazil because Brazilians have different complex, you know, it's kind of stupid things that nothing can be backed up by any kind of evidence. But anyway, it was it people believe that. So there was something just, you know, saying how can, you know, even government be in the such kind of uh, denial? On this side, it's been an unprecedented cooperation of medical um, community from China to identify the virus, to, to put its genome and to send it everywhere and to, to bring massive vaccines worldwide in a year only, which has been really, really quick. And even if the vaccine of very, very modern technology doing an RNA messengers that opened the way also for curing HIV, for curing degenerative disease, for curing cancer. So these new things of the new vaccine done on such a broad scale bring a level of experiment that probably will open new ways for modern medicine. It's maybe the biggest breakthrough in curing many diseases that were considered as uncurable today. Uh, and it's gone in a year. Normally we have gone to two or three years. So there's been an unprecedented cooperation. So meaning we are before, l compared to before, much, much more linked together, much more interwinded. Something happening in China is something happening in the US and something happening everywhere. We cannot say it will stay there. Virus don't know any borders and travelers as well. And when you stop the economy, you have a serious problem. But then the cooperation has been much faster, meaning the cooperation of information has been fast. So in some way, what would have been a real disaster if we had combined the health problem with an internet shutdown? If internet had not been able to absorb the massive evolution of connections and uh, transactions online, then we had gone to really, really bad crisis worldwide. While this one in some way is not that bad because the internet held on. Also have to realize that things were not possible 100 years ago because about 80% of population were living in the countryside in something doing manual work and also arts and crafts that have to have their physical present on the ground, would not have been any possibility to make any lockdown. It was possible to make lockdown because people could work from home. About more than 80% of people could work from home. Agriculture now employs only 1% of the population, highly mechanized. People, don't ha people can keep social distance, even in agriculture, in supply chain, in manufacturing goods. So the biggest part of manufacturing supply chain of an essential good have been able to work even with majority of people were staying at home. So people could stay at home because the entire infrastructure had made it possible to do it. And the first time in history. The Spanish flu was devastating, first because population in Europe was very tired after the First World War, but it was also impossible to keep people separate from each other. Now it has become possible to do it, meaning if we prepare the health system in all the countries to have the infrastructure ready, to have the cooperation ready, the next pandemic will just become a joke. If we don't learn anything, it will become really worse. If it's not the COVID, but something like Ebola transmitting, then it will be really bad. But we show and we know we are ready for it. Then in terms of business, same. If we learn from it and how this, this crisis has changed space and time, and if we learn from it, then we can write through it quite well. 
we, because this has been very quick and very short in some way, but also diverging in many ways and being different in different countries. So I think it's the next question coming. Yes, in, in fact, I just... W if we move on thing, having more and mental representation of what's quantum mechanics and not Newton physics, then we have a framework of thinking that is very useful to understand how to run this crisis. Probably we can uh, uh, go a bit uh, deeper to this uh, mindset shifts uh, in terms of our consumer behaviors and uh, inspired by your brilliant and deep blog piece, Quantum Mechanics, uh, uh, realize that the world uh, will enter into post-COVID era with very fragmented uh, mindset. And by the way, I invite everyone to follow Cyril on LinkedIn. <laughs> Truly uh, extremely interesting post and uh, vision which you can read um, and just digest. Uh, so how this uh, might impact uh, the consumer's behavior? Uh, so um, first begin this room and having this uh, Rembrandt, I guess, uh, painting about the return of the prodigal son, right? Yes. And uh, what is important? We saw it yesterday in Hermitage. And, uh, and I knew it also <laughs> in uh, Rembrandt as a quite famous painting. So I, didn't, I never had seen the real one, but uh, anyway. And uh, there is something we can link to generation and something there is a uh, son coming and it's forgiveness. It's something say we have to learn from what we've done and this son say I've learned from my mistake. And the father say I forgive you even if you, you have left and dilapidated the money. So you know what this uh, painting tells us is about solidarity in generation and about forgiveness and about recognizing our errors. And one thing in, in presented period that we have to know that many things we don't know we make mistakes and we have to learn from them and we have to have solidarity. So this period will be a period of coalitions, of for sustainability and of new solidarity. And this painting tells that and it's been there for about 200 years. So we can learn from the past to know how to behave in the present. The best learning from what we can learn when things are unpresented and look farther in the past. There was some question, for instance, about artificial intelligence and robotics. They say, what happens when people don't work? What would they do? Well, it's more a question how to transfer wealth. Because if you look at 2,000 years ago, Roman time, and Rome as a city, it had 2 million inhabitants, and half of them were not working at all. So some were slaves, some were soldiers, some were, were, were traded. But the biggest part of those living in Rome were not doing anything. Rome was not producing anything. Of course, whose taxes could get some wealth from the rest of the empire. But had made a society working on mutual endeavors that would stay for quite some time. And there was very interesting part that the social life was go to the therms and the uh, baths from uh, Caracalla or, or Dioclesia. They were enormous things. There were 5,000 people a day. People would gather there because they have to know what they think. Even the nobles would go there to know what people think. Then there was also some temples. Everyone had the right to have their own religion. And for those who have known their temple, there was a pantheon for everyone to go. So understanding cooperation, social relation, transferring of wealth, keeping people busy. It's been explored in the past. And so if we think that uh, we have to work on that, then we have to learn from what was done in Rome or what was done in Xi'an in the, in the period of Chinese time when the capital were not producing anything, but people find a way to live together. That's the first thing, that things are never as unprecedented as we think. Many things have happened already. So that's uh, a part. Then. We have always a difficulty to say we can only act on what we can represent. We have some mental framework, we have automatic thinking, and that we face something different, we get lost. And many, most of our scientific thinking is linked to the Newtonian physics, or something predictable. Everything we do from, uh, from monitoring, from uh, recording, from budgeting, is linked to something like that. Also, we have to we go to some norms that define the way we understand the world, which are very dangerous. And I can give a very simple example. We work under the IFRS norms, and, 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 and I don't know it's kind of the third or fourth version, but there is something in there where it is uh, said that personal expense are operating expense. It's a cost. And there is some part in the productivist view of the world that you have to reduce your cost, and you learn that, how to make something cost efficient. So why do we consider personal expense as a cost and not as a capital? The brand we resisted the best have those who have very strong human capital. So if you consider as capital, you invest on people, you should not consider as a cost. On the contrary, we consider retail as an asset and as an investment, 
which are the value. But when people don't travel, all the travel retail are worth nothing. So why do we consider the store, physical store, as a sets and people as a cost? Why in luxury we should continue reverse? If we're in things with creativity that matters, then people matter more than walls. So we should put more value on people and less on walls. But the system makes it work this way. Also, we consider things as a cost of goods or something. But if we take the entire value chain in some way, everything is cash and everything is a kind of uh, profit. But then, what means return on investment if the walls means nothing? We should think about return on ideas. So in the modern world, return on ideas and return on kindness mean more than return on investment in the way we do. If we think solidarity matters, we have to think about written on kindness, even if it doesn't exist. Meaning everything we do for the community, for solidarity, through philanthropy and actions, will have probably a written in good one in some way, not measurable. And you should not do that to expect something in return right away. But like this, you don't expect anything and you give and you receive. So return on investment should be reconsidered with written on ideas and written on kindness. But this is not never written in textbooks and never written in the accounting books and doesn't exist. Human capital is never valued. Brand equity is never valued. But these are the two key sets that we have to invest in long time. Then coming to more to the quantum world. Um, because we are in a world of th liking predictability and, and clean trajectory and things, when it comes to randomness, probabilities and things who are too unstable, we're a bit distorted. So when think, well, there's something chaotic happening, we just hope that at the end it will be over. But if we think about what is the framework of quantum mechanics, then we can do things differently in a way which are very, very active and very operational. And I will give example. So uh, in, a, in a quantum, uh, the, a, a particle can be, can be a wave as well. It can be a two place at the same time. It can be a trajectory you don't know. And if you want to follow it, a, a very fast particle, you have to choose between the speed or location. You cannot measure both. And, uh, and uh, there are also some parts where particles can be entangled or they can be superposed, meaning they, they take properties different when they are together or they take properties that are the same, even if they are not connected to each other. There is a synchronicity you can't explain by any causality because it travels faster than the speed of light, which is impossible in, in regular physics. So what is, what, what is in the world that it with us? Then in a traditional way of doing budgeting, we do a, a budget scenario and we try to apply that to all the elements of the, uh, of the uh, supply chain or all the value chains at a company. But if we have a part which is very chaotic, you cannot do that. Meaning you can have equal probability on a high and low scenario, either globally or in certain area. It's impossible to know even now for nine months from now if Chinese borders will be open and your customers will buy in China or in Hong Kong. We just don't know. And it doesn't really matter. So on one side, if we think we can plan for both because we know that the Chinese customers are in growing phase and they will grow their sales, we can plan for that, not knowing where it will go. And then at the last minute, we go very fast to drop when the window is open. So high velocity to go right away, not knowing the location at first. So we can choose velocity against location, and it will work. Then if we have to plan for multiple scenario, we have to take equal chance that both will happen, whether high or whether low. And what happened this year is that by planning something can be extremely bad to something extremely positive. In fact, both scenarios took place, like in quantum, meaning China went super well and Hong Kong were super bad. Retail went super well and travel retail super bad. So the two scenarios of good and bad, in fact, happen at the same time. And that's very much some logic that you have when you deal with quantum probabilities. And if we know that things can be entangled, and you say, if this happens here, it might happen there in the same way or the reverse way. In this case, you say, if the borders are open, then the, the something probably will, sh will shift from China to Hong Kong, and something on the opposite will shift the other way. So if you think about flexibility, about budgeting, about scenario planning, like quantum, then you can ride rather well. And we have been the fastest brand to rebound because we work in this logic. Also, you have to understand the distortion of space and time and the warping of space time. It's both something explored in uh, quantum physics and also in the general uh, relativity. And we tend to think we all have the same space time, and it's not true. 
So the fact that, uh, that China has rebounded fast, it means China is already in post-COVID, and we're already in COVID here, and some have not even started. So when we think, what is the right time frame to think about what is the post-COVID, we have to understand that some areas are already in there and some not yet. So we have a distortion in time at how things materialize. The other thing, we have distortion of how fast things move. So China is accelerating where Europe is slowing down. Slow Europe is slowing down its energy. So the overall things in the way you need, what time you need to change things in Europe will get slower and slower, where things faster and faster in China. So the acceptance of digital is going super fast in China and slowing down in Europe, especially because of the COVID, even if the number of computers and transactions have increased. So where we deal with time and words and, 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 uh, and relationship of people with time, we have to understand that this crisis has changed the perception of space-time. And if we understand that, we can do things which are timely in a different place. So it's a bit long, but it's, uh, it's always to say, what is the framework we have? If we're in a framework of predictability, we are all lost. If we take the framework of uh, uncertainty, probabilities, randomness, uh, the, the principle of Heisenberg of uh, uncertainty applies super well. Then we know what to do and how to act on it because we're a mental framework that is better suited for the current time. So, and that's where source of inspiration can come from anywhere. You can, you can get inspired by Rembrandt and you can get inspired by quantum mechanics and say, what does it tell me to act today? And that's what leader's role can be. Yes, it's a beautiful mix of physics and uh, art. Uh, Cyril, uh, I propose uh, to move uh, to some questions related to Europe and China. You already uh, mentioned some difference. But first, I, I would like to ask you uh, about um, uh, European clients, uh, because with Travel Up and the uh, European heritage brands, uh, like refocusing on the locals uh, after the decades, many years when we were uh, courting international clients, international travelers. So does Cartier recalibrate its message uh, to better connect with the European clients? So the, um, the link with European, uh, I think, clients and culture in both ways. Meaning, uh, it's not. Or we can say it's uh, it's it's it, it, it just went like that randomly, but I don't think it was that the the part which has become the international luxury and and universal luxury basically all came from Europe. Very very few brands have emerged from the U.S. There is uh, Tiffany or Graf or Harrow instance. Some have, some have or I was saying. Um, uh, some in the fashion brand, there there are, there are some uh, some uh, as well, uh, but not so many. And same in in, in Asia, there were some uh, very very high luxurious proposal, but very very localized. Not not that those can go and go beyond the, the borders of what they have uh, explored. So why is it so? Because the link with European culture can have universal aspiration, and so the fact to constantly have in mind that that. The luxury, as we know, was born in Europe with some sense of relationship with people, with objects, with know-how, with quality, and perception of the self, and something that can be universally accepted is something important. So we constantly have to think that uh, as far as get in tune with what Europe is about, then this brand can be vitalized. If they come to say, we only tra target Chinese customers, for instance, or it can be Middle Eastern customers, any other customer, and we don't also care whether a European ha can, can feel at one with that. Or also, we lose our, also, um, I think, uh, aesthetic ground or a cultural ground to, to produce something that can be suitable for all clientele. Probably sooner or later, those customers will also lose their interest. They, there is a part where there is um, an uh, attraction for a kind of a, a European dream of what is a kind of the, the, the nice life of those who are wealthy from and perceive as something that came from a long, long time. How to be, especially in a life where you don't work so much and you can enjoy beauty and culture. And, and it's true, some part more linked to art, that when you're into it, you never end. If you like music, if you like ballet, if you like opera, you can see as many times you will never get tired. If you like architecture, you can travel in Europe all over and you will never finish to discover new things. And even in the cities you know, there are some hidden treasures you have never seen before. And even on that very remote church, you have some, some beautiful frescoes. And constantly travel, constantly find things. 
and I was really happy this time. It was the first time for me to visit the Hermitage Museum. It was always so high on my list and never could do it. And for the first time I could. And, I, and, and it was so short, I say I have to come back. But even uh, when uh, we had a market visit, uh, it was now a year and a half ago, two years ago, when we went to Kiev, and I saw the Saint Sophie in Kiev, and it was beautiful Byzantine architecture and beautiful frescoes, and it was so touching and moving. And then I found something like that also in Ravenna and some other part also in Cremona, that in fact Cremona was also linked to Ravenna and linked to Byzance in a way I didn't think it would be, because so close to Milan, but it was different. And when you see all this European thread, it's so interesting to follow and to understand how rich the history is. So whilst the customers from around the world will never end coming in here and to find all this beauty, but also how this translates in luxury, it's also in a kind of a lifestyle, which is, even if it's an imagination, that anyway exists, or how it can live a nice life of culture, of art, and of enjoyment without getting bored and without having something that you wonder what you're doing. So this part is in interwinded in a way that we have to constantly reinforce our link to European culture. And to do that also to attract European customers in the way they can be all generation. And so the problem is not that we have been connected, dealing and try to see the growth in uh, other market because the Asian market was 20 years ago more Japanese and then Korean and Chinese now, American, are growing more and the wealth is growing there much more than in Europe. The problem of Europe is that the wealth is not distributed properly, it's held by the elder generation, and that the potential for young generation to grow their wealth in Europe is less than before. And that's uh, the, the bad story about what the bad European management from the different regions or government have created. When I graduated from the school, 75% of my generation could have higher income and, and, uh, and life um, standard than their parents. Now it's only 25 in Europe. And in some, s in some countries, it's, m it's less than that because of unemployment. Russian is doing quite well in there because becoming very young and the perspective of growth are quite good. Of course, not in all the cities, but doing quite well. In Middle East, in China, it's very strong. But so that's a problem of the aspiration and old generation that they have much, much less money than before. And the cost of living has increased, meaning to live today as a student in London if you don't have support from your parents, it's very hard. And for a period of time, with uh, pre-COVID, people could do some uh, little job to work as waiter or so forth to help. But now everything stopped. So in some way, the education industry in the, U in the UK is collapsing because people have no visa, and those who come, they cannot go into university physically, and those who come, they cannot pay for their tuition fees. And that's a serious issue that we have. And when they do that, when they graduate, if they borrow money, then they have to reimburse their money. In the US, there is an enormous problem of students' debts. There are about $3 trillion of student debts that they will never repay. It's more than the uh, subprime problem that people have borrowed from their future too much. But as government, we should not put that burden on the young generation to start after graduation to have so much money that they owe to a bank that don't need. And even the university don't need the money. Well, uh, who don't says? <laughs> don't quote. It depends on. I, I think about the Harvard Business School. Harvard Business School has a fund. They have about thirty-five billion dollars of their foundation. They are one of the biggest real estate uh, landlord in the world, and they get more from that than any of their tuition fees. Anyway, what they charge for foreign students is just crazy. They should give uh, all they should do, but give more scholarship. But why do they need to do that? They have enough money. One in the world, but their, their investment and their balance sheet is so strong. And then they give even more donation to make new buildings they don't need. There's constantly new building coming on the Harvard campus, where, where many universities need one-tenth of what they have. So wh why? Why? So there is this question in Europe and in the US to say, what is the value of education? And if something is human capital, we should put more money on education and less on real estate and and do better with the pension scheme. And so our role also is to say we should encourage young people to continue to love products and to wear. So when we relaunched the Panther watch, we offered the repair for free. And because the design was a kind of long-lasting design, we saw many coming out of the drawers and the mothers give them to their daughters to wear in a way which was free. Otherwise, just to pay for the repair costs would be expensive. 
And thanks to that, our visibility increased. We sold 20,000 in the first year and has 20,000 repaired. And young people wore it. And Carty became young again in Europe, in Japan, even for those who didn't have money for it, but were happy to wear it. So Carty got younger by encouraging young people to wear it. So in a way also to use sustainability is how to reuse. So reduce, reuse, recycle. If we open some repair for free, then everyone will wear and, and then we increase longevity of the products. So it's also coming into a part of circular economy inside the same family. So if we take into account that Europe has gone wrong with its youth, let's try to do the other way around and bring things that the young people can enjoy. And they continue to wear and the brand becomes younger. So it's not to say let's do some uh, young products for youngish customer. Let's do something to encourage them to see the beauty around them in the same way our ge other generation did. And the young customers love our oldest products. Our love bracelet is 60 years old design. Justin includes 60 years. Don't quote 100 years. Timeless design don't age. So they can be relevant to any generation as far as you talk to them properly. So if it's only a question of, of, of capital or earning, let's, let's make something available for everyone that can enjoy. And at some point, they will get also more money to buy something more expensive. So the, the fact to recalibrate the messaging, in fact, was more think how to address young customers, knowing that they have much less money than their parents. They have very high knowledge because they saw their family, and things have been part of the culture for 35 years. But there is a question of purchasing power among young generation. And we should not put a burden for them, but help them to go there and to appreciate the beauty that they have not been able to see before. Thank you, Cyril. And uh, since uh, we talk a lot about the success and the just amazing growth in China in terms of business development through different industries, at the same time, uh, analysts nowadays uh, advise diversify away from China in mid-long term and uh, uh, invite us to look to another lucrative opportunity in Africa and India. So what is your plan? What is your vision? Would you recommend to look at these new regions? So First of all, when it thinks about uh, wealth growth, uh, China for the next 10 years remains the best growth play. I Meaning China is still a middle income country. It has become to the second economy worldwide and will soon be number one. But the average income per capita is still $15,000, between 15 to 20. Uh, well, well in, uh, in Japan it's 35 and, and, and in the US it's higher and we think the higher part population is much higher. So. The fact that uh, the number of those going in their in their personal wealth quite significantly will make that very soon, next coming five years, new new more million people in China will get to the level that they can afford luxury. Where when it comes to India, it's growing with something at uh, 15 years behind, and uh, with the political uh, difficulties, things are not growing as fast as it could be. So still a lot of import duties, meaning the uh, uh, purchasing power parity. The middle class in India is quite rich, but in world standard, it's not so much. Meaning, what you you can you can in uh, key cities in uh, in uh, Bombay or in um, um, Mumbai or um, or Delhi, you can you can eat for two euros and you have a full meal. But you go in Switzerland, you know, for what you in for two euros, you have nothing. And so our products are priced in European pricing. And so compared to the average income in euro base, you know, very very few Indians can 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 buy that. So this would change, but probably it takes, an, it takes some time because the way it comes from a middle income at purchasing power parity to middle income at world currency parity and to grow there will take some time. And because of that, it will be difficult. Also, uh, there is a very strong Indian tradition of aesthetics, of jewelry, of gold, and the way it's very decorative and very, very special. And also made that you buy the gold, you give to your goldsmith and he does, or a jewelry and do something for you. So it's just try to negotiate on manpower. There are very few things coming to branded jewelry with branded design. So it has to open up and then has to open up something to see the value of international design compared to the value of doing something which is the same as everyone's wearing for different occasions. So India is a long-term good play, but a long-term. Africa is very fragmented. Uh, and, and it is growing both in population and in wealth, um, but very diffi diff different from different countries. Very difficult to operate. Uh, many zones are, are uh, with a lot of a problem with, uh, with uh, safety and, uh, and violence and so uh, 
uh, those wealthy customers really want to wear things. You know, uh, if you go to Johannesburg, uh, you say, you know, don't take any taxi. You have to have a, a car before, and you have to stay in your hotel. Don't walk in the street. So even less wearing anything valuable, you know. And so, uh, and, and, and even worse in Lagos, when the one of the key business is kidnapping. So people will not show off at all what they have. So usually these ones are, are buying mostly in Europe, I meaning Angolese in Portugal or Nigerian in, in, uh, in London, Moroccan in France, because uh, buying and wearing in African countries and cities is often quite difficult. So I think uh, Africa is a growing play on clientele and must be present and encourage people to have strong operation there remains quite, uh, quite a challenge so far. So these two regions are, are a good place uh, as far as we must have a presence and the difficulty how to create awareness and, and develop the knowledge about the brand without having strong presence that, that cannot be done today before all of these reasons. So it's more about the presence and uh, uh, the brand awareness which we can build and the uh, dialogue which we can build with the diasporas and from the these regions? The diasporas, for instance, yes. And also when we're digital, we can do many things because all those customers also, they travel, they want to look for information. And that's where digital footprint is an important part, including culture, including know-how, not doing it necessarily for e-com, but how to, g to give information about what you do. Also, knowing that this customer, the wealthy one, they travel, what will you offer if they want to come to St. Petersburg or Moscow or London or so forth? That will be an attraction in there, doing some events or pop-ups or so. So we have to use all the desynchronized flow. Again, more question of quantum. If you don't think of unity of space and time, but different space, different time, different speed, then you can do things to attract these customers and grow your share of mind, even if you don't have a strong presence in there. But using women where they will be in different places to encourage them, to invite them to do an experience that will just in their mind. And just to finish uh, this business block, I would say, um, in January, we just discussed it uh, in the morning, uh, you um, didn't celebrate, but uh, we should celebrate uh, your five years uh, on this um, position as the president of our Maison. So you entered the sixth year. So probably I will rephrase it a bit, not only uh, the question about your key learnings, but probably what is your advice, since uh, we have some uh, potential candidates uh, for business management in different industries. Um, well, the, the first... Uh First thing I would say, uh, as I was meant not meant to go to luxury, and I was not meant to be a CEO. Uh, it just happened. So I didn't plan my career for that, and uh, my career made me. And so, so everything's possible. I I asked job I was refused. I refused job I was offered. Uh, so I would leave, and I stayed, and then I left uh, to, to the Richmond Group after 25 years. Uh, and thinking I would never come back. And then I, I was called to my surprise and came back. And so I became president. And, uh, and the moment where it was difficult. So, you know, I graduated in, f in finance and budgeting. I started to do something in relation to IT and I moved to product creation and, and things. And, uh, and so, you know, everything's possible. So first of all, that's one thing. It's, uh, but be ready to have plan A with no plan B. I think there is no safe road for, for safe success. You can have safe road to average success, but if you want something different, you know, be ready for something different. Either you go to make your own company and take your own risk, or you go to something where you don't know. So when I had, and I was in Japan, and was this chain, I was first for Cartier and then for Richemont, and then there was a change in strategy, and I say, I understand, but this means that I have to just cancel my own job. And the current CEO say, how do you know? I say, well, it's very clear and logical. If you do this, it means probably you don't need someone like me. So I just have to search for some job outside. And so it was clear for me it would be the end. And then I was, uh, and then I, he offered another job and I said no. And, uh, and of course, if you say no to a CEO, you just, don't, you just say okay. But I had no other job, but I knew that I could not do it. So it was the first big jump to say to something where it was unknown. And then I, I got another job in Europe. And again, at the end of that seven years, I thought I had done my job, and so I had to leave. Uh, and I left, and I got a, no a very nice offer from LVMH uh, in Japan to go back to Japan. And, and, and I've been, I, I love Japan. I remarried in Japan. My wife Japanese. My children were born there, so I feel at home there. It was, it was really great. Um, 
But my colleagues were saying, I was 52 years old, they say, but uh, what if you don't get along with them? They are known to be, you know, a very strong group, very good, but quite demanding. And uh, what is your plan B? I say, well, there's no plan B, only plan A. I say, what if plan A doesn't work? Well, plan A has to work. <laughs> After that, I have to trust life because I don't know. So I ask my wife, so are you okay to that? I say, of course, uh, we're together, we are together, so we think it can work, so we have to do. And you know, if it doesn't work, we might be in trouble. Yes, I know, but that's why we're together, so it's okay. So in some way, the most important fact in my career has been to meet my wife and to be together as a strong couple and to say that if things happen, it's happened together, and then we can go to things we say we just don't know. But the fact to not know together is more than when you don't know alone. So that's a strong part. So find the right partner. The best choice in your life is also to have something. Be trusting yourself, true to who you are, and also if you can find, when I say partner, it can be a partner, it can be a mentor, it can be, a co it can be an associate. You know, when you do things not alone, it's something important, you know. I'm doing a strong support to the, to the Russian team and to Yanina. Because when she was promoted, she was very young. She's still very I'm young. She's very young. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's much younger than me, at least. <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, it was all something we say in Russia, you need to have you know, strong men. So, you know, we have a young woman, and she's doing super well but she needs support and help. And so uh, we need to have some this kind of a network of trust that helps you to go through the different challenge. So, I And I see already the reaction on the first row. You have yes, seen yourself. Guys, it's really so if you have found that, you know you can go through <laughs> anything, any crisis in life, because anyway, if you trust life, life will trust you. So could go thing, but then I'd be ready to take some plan A and no plan B. And I was in Japan doing well, and then uh, to my surprise, I was called back to say, do you want to come back to Kenya? I said, no, I, I, I've gone. Do you want to come back and be the president? Uh, uh, can I say no? I say no, because the predecessor is becoming six, and we need someone, and so to knowing him well enough, so we need you, so please come. And say, I said, okay. And then it was in the middle of the year, and I had to do something. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> obligation first. Yeah. Yeah, good. Thank you very much. Bye. And so I um, had to go in the middle of the year and to come back from Tokyo to Geneva in the middle of winter. And, uh, and my wife gave me the best advice ever to say, don't complain. You know, we are all going through that with the children <laughs> and so forth in the <laughs> middle of the night, in the middle of the, middle of the winter. It will be hard for all of us. It will be hard for you, but we equally hard for us. So don't complain. And I didn't complain. And, s and I survived. And uh, and after five years, they're saying the brand is doing quite okay. So so I think the learning is that that, that trust your gut feeling, and uh, and it's some part of uh, you know all the uh, warriors, especially uh, Chinese ethics. They say, be true to who you are, be brave, and be loyal. And if you do that, then of course you have to be competent for what you do. It's a little kind of a side side part of the job, but um, it's not all. And so this big thing is say. Also, the biggest choice of life don't come with rational thing. If it's rational, there is no choice. You know, you 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 you, you balance A and B. You find the answer A is much better than B. You choose A. It's not a choice. It's just kind of a your business decision as usual. Real life choice you don't know. It's a it's a it's a leap of faith, and it's called you know, uh, confidence or self confidence. It's called come from Latin cum fides with faith. The biggest choice in life, come with your conviction and with faith. So the learning also came that and, uh, and I had to do a lot of change, a lot of things were going wrong and it was difficult for people to realize and to accept it. So I say f we have to do first the state of the nation, realize where it went wrong and what we have to do. And doing that we will change these things and go. So I say first don't blame ourselves for what's gone wrong or so forth. So small mistakes, we forget. Medium one, we learn. Big one, we avoid. And big, big one, I resign. So it's fine. <laughs> it's okay. And I presented the plan to the board and say we have to change this and that and come and say, well, but you know, what if the plan doesn't go well? Why if the plan doesn't go well? I resign. So it's okay. We believe in this plan. It's strong conviction. We put all our energy into it. And we think it would work. And if it doesn't work, I will go. And so with this kind of commitment, we got the board approval to make serious changes and we went through them one after another. And after that, most of them happened to be correct. 
Not all, because we make mistakes and we have things we've been struggling to redevelop our leather activity and it doesn't work as much as we wanted. But overall, many things went well because we created this culture of transparency and change and facing reality and understanding with curiosity and making this change. And we continuously learn. And so the other learning is I'm continuously learning and learning and learning. And I've never finished. We will continue to learn. <laughs> Thank you very much, Cyril. I propose to move to uh, a next block. And uh, we already talk a lot about the communication. Uh, and I think that uh, today we can see that uh, brands compete not only in terms of product message and in general what we can see from consumers from our customer that they are quite uh, overloaded with the generic uh, brand content through all the media channels so they really respond on something uh, non-commercial I would say um, and uh, we can see that within uh, last year or even within last two years brands more compete with the culture of the brand and how they transmit it to their clients so how to find this right at the same time brand uh, product of course uh, show the belonging to the universe of the brand and for some clients it's very important so how to find the uh, proper proportion between this product communication and non-commercial uh, communication so f first of all, I think a big change that has come in the luxury is that uh, thanks to digital, brands have become their own media and they may not have realized it. Uh, before, you used to have something where you create your own narration, you give to the media agency, you get a publishing company, you print a magazine and give to customers. And because this, uh, the, the end part of the resource, meaning a luxury magazine, is quite limited and you have once per month only and you have a really big battle for the cover page and uh, you don't hear me anymore? Uh, I yes, you should. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I hold like that, I create interference and don't hear me. Okay. <laughs> Is it good like this? I say we should be always aware of technique, you know, so, uh, sorry. So um, the, um, the, the, the brands are becoming their own media. They can go out of this part to be, to be tight in the magazines with go one third. And because of the value then given to the cover page four and so forth, then say let's do something efficient and bring basically products on this part. And then the cover four, the cover two, the opposite to content, you had the kind of a really kind of a hierarchy of, uh, of, uh, of the media space. And so in some way it can't limit it also to a growing phase where people wanted to know brands by their names and also by products that they, they, they dispatch. Would go also with few movies and things, but with digital, things have opened up in many, many ways. So you can post something on your own social media and then if you have followers, they will do, if you have influencers, they will replicate and do some echo and you can do some movies and things. So you can do many more things and the brand have become their own media directly uh, from the communication team or through the retail because retail and retail stores have become their own media by not only by the windows, but doing some pop-ups, doing some events inside the store. So we create media also in terms of event. What has been done here with these uh, art dialogues Either way, to be a very fantastic media to talk about cultural and sociological uh, questions coming to now. And we can organize that. In the past, we could not probably have done that without a media agency or publishing company backing it up. First, to, to know how to produce it, but then also how to get the audience. So now, it was fine, and there were 12,000 viewers live, yes. and there were millions of viewers and posts afterwards meaning on something produced by ourselves. And even with the borders closed, they had to produce everything alone. Yes, and unite people across the world and students from different universities. And uh, probably, uh, if I may, I would like to offer to see the short video about our recent project with Hermitage Museum and the exhibition. And in fact, you can find uh, the white uh, uh, package uh, close to you with uh, the gift and uh, we just invite you to visit. We still have several days before exhibition will be closed. So please come to Hermitage and see our cross-cultural and uh, cross-generational uh, dialogue which we did with this beautiful museum. So I propose... So I, can I continue and I had not finished my point. Oh. Yes, I'm and sorry. Well, just yes. one second and then we come then to this one. So we have been now being uh, available and do things and many kind of narration. And so in some way, how to talk about savoir faire, how to talk about history, about patrimony, what it means now. The more you collaborate with museums and with exhibition and things, the easier it can be. So we have come to, n to other ways of narration, can talk about ourselves in different way. Also new customers are expecting not only what do we do as product, but who we are. 
So it's important to have a lot of non, say non not only non-product, but non-commercial activities, meaning a boutique opening can be also a traditional way. But that would express who we are and, and how we interact with the world. So that's where we had gone in, uh, in, in different initiatives, like the Carty Women's Initiative, been there for 17 years, or the Carty Philanthropy, which was kind of regathered for all the different things to be one entity that supports the life of the most vulnerable. And also with the Fondation pour l'art contemporain, who was there for, for, for 35 years, to have other kind of coalition and partnership, like Triennale de Milan, and then other institutions that want to cooperate with us to produce some original content. So we see that, in fact, the need to expand the range of non-commercial activities is growing, and the need to communicate on those, not to say what we do, but who we are. And it's an increasing need of the current world. Because we have also to have commitments, and we have to say what we do, how we do them, take commitment for the future, and report on them. But so, I will leave now to this movie to see how this collaboration could go many forms yeah. with one of the oldest institutions in St. Petersburg. Une salle décorativement puissante et euh, des objets très forts en eux-mêmes. Donc c'est de trouver un liant. Такие высокохудожественные вещи вызывают восторг у каждого, кто их видит. Russia is an eternal source of inspiration for all of us. And so that's why this project is so dear to us and dear to my heart. Отправной точкой данного проекта являлась, безусловно, реставрационная работа над экспонатами из коллекции Государственного музея Эрмитажа. И выставка, в общем-то, не являлась целью этого проекта, а стала таким очень естественным, органичным этапом пятилетнего сотрудничества. Clairement, cette exposition est un hommage à l'artisanat et aux techniques d'exception, je dirais, à, à l'art de la main euh, des artisans et des artisans, je dirais, de tous les pays. Проект поистине мультикультурный, именно потому что и экспонаты, которые мы представляем, принадлежат разным культурам. Также команда, которая работала над этим проектом, это тоже международная команда, что особенно ценно и важно в наше время. И, в общем, каждый артизан, d'ailleurs, пуизит в другие культуры, aussi, ses évolutions и, я думаю, свою инспирацию. Пять памятников Эрмитажа, которые были отреставрированы нашими реставраторами, они происходят из разного времени, из разных стран и охватывают период более тысячи лет. Были выбраны самые уникальные предметы, которые были переданы нам в лабораторию, начиная с... От 10 века экспонаты и вплоть до 18 века, до даже 19 века. Там требовалось довольно серьезное вмешательство, и мы использовали как традиционные технологии, так и новые. По времени, если говорить о реставрационных направлениях, то это было в среднем около полугода на каждый экспонат. Очень много. Каждый из этих предметов нашими коллегами из команды Cartier была дополнена теми предметами, которые, на их взгляд, были наиболее интересны или наиболее знаково могли корреспондироваться с нашими памятниками. Par la disposition dans l'espace, au centre, en position dominante, il y a l'objet d'art qui a réuni euh, l'Hermitage et la Maison Cartier. Et déployés autour comme des satellites ou des extensions sont les œuvres de haute joie de la collection Cartier qui gravitent mieux par une force invisible autour de cet objet. Cette force invisible, c'est justement un lien de continuité qui soit stylistique par la matière. Это соединение меценатства, выставочной деятельности, реставрационной. Это совершенно правильное понимание, как надо обходиться с наследием. Его надо беречь, его надо с ним устраивать переклички, его надо показывать. И показывать его надо в разных диалогах. Диалог между старинным ювелирным искусством и новым. 
и диалог между эрмитажной коллекцией и коллекцией картин. Thinking about heritage should not be like a dusty things from the past, but first looking at these beautiful aesthetics and then in restoring how these were made is a constant source of inspiration and joy. Это проект взаимодействия культур. Это самое важное, то, чем занимаются музеи. Музеи не выставляют красивые вещи, они строят их в диалоге. Вдохновили? Приходите, посмотрите. Сириль uh, and... Uh, and we also had another co cooperation, a bit similar, of course, different in the content, with the Palace Museum in Beijing, where also went some uh, restoration of some old clocks and things, and then went to a magnificent exhibition called Beyond Boundaries. And we had an enormous uh, reaction. Well, of course, China is big, but there have been 600,000 visitors in two months, and the connection on the digital world a bit enormous and the, and the attention for young customers for heritage and for history has been just phenomenal. So when you combine things like that, uh, uh, restoration progress project and, and exhibition and a way to have a scenography that can talk, then you can have an enormous, uh, uh, I think, uh, positive reaction. Like, uh, the question is always how to get young people attention and so we need to have new forms of narration for it. But it's not that there is lack of interest. It is just in a, a multiplicity of a solicitation for many things. So spend the hours on, the, on, on smartphone and on these hours do some many, many things that I have to say, hey, get out of your iPhone and go and see something. And then from there, learn from it. So that's all right. But you have to also help us in doing that. How can you do that in an efficient way? to grab this attention for doing something meaningful. And it's so great uh, that uh, the university also has a lot of uh, collaborative projects with Hermitage. Uh, so even here we have some common ground. And uh, I propose we, we still we, we have like 10, uh, 15 minutes to talk and I propose to move to another very interesting chapter dedicated to some uh, new trends and uh, also shifts. Uh, um, let's talk about uh, women agenda and uh, probably uh, DNA as well. Um, so, uh, in fact, uh, just several years ago, we uh, we started to talk about the local recognition of women in art, in business, and today what we can see is that all mega brands, they launch uh, special programs to support uh, women in art, in business, and uh, for us, it's not something that we just started. We have a long uh, story <coughs> behind, and uh, this is our commitment, which we already demonstrated within the last 15 years, I would say. But we didn't talk about that, but now we started to communicate. And in general, our brand is uh, just a, a devotion to women, I would say, and women is a source of inspiration for us uh, by uh, different uh, angles. So. Uh, what is our agenda today? Why it's so important? Which, which uh, changes uh, we witnessed within uh, last years in terms of women in the company, uh, women as our uh, customers? So, please. First, I, I should have brought my uh, he for she uh, pin. Mm -hmm. uh, for those who know, there it is uh, uh, started by United Nations Women, and it was Emma Watson, I think, who started this initiative. Say. If we want to develop, you know, the uh, women empowerment, we also need to involve men who have, uh, you know, good uh, will for that. And so I'm, I'm part of it. I was I received it from Muli uh, Matata. <laughs> Sorry, it's my <laughs> there's a kind of you know some, something saying be careful of what you say. <laughs> so, <laughs> but so and I'm and I'm really happy with it. Um, the part also when you say uh, what can be in uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, many part of the business were run by men. But uh, for Cartier. 65% of clients are women, or even more. 65% of our staff and managers in, in, the, in the boutiques were also women, which in some way fine. So when you say about gender equality, should we have 50-50? Well, if we have 65% clients women, let's say 65% staff as women is quite fine. But then when it came to management, it was not the case. 25 years ago, when I, when I, and I was uh, the, 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 the president of Cartier Japan, we had 22 subsidiaries, there was only one woman as manager, and the, and the executive committee was dominantly men. So this is an imbalance, which is not fine. But we also have to have in mind that anyway, 
50 years, it's only 50 years in Europe that women can access to business school. I think from INSEAD or uh, HEC in Paris and SCP, the first, I think, one came in 1973. So the fact that in 1990 there was no one ready for it is just that the educational system was not allowing women to go. For some reason, that looked very rational at that time and say, wait, what is the role of women? The role of women is to get married, have children. And so why would they study? Because if they study, it's very expensive, we have to subsidize that, and at the end they will do something else. So we should stop doing that, and so let them do what they want, but not spend a lot of public money on women's education, even in France, UK, and so forth. So it looks like something in third world countries, but it's not. It was like that. So fortunately it changed, and, uh, and there was then a generation of women highly competent to do it. But then men didn't want to give them this right thinking, you know, they are not ready, and uh, they are too emotional, they are too like this, too like that. Yes, I've heard it many times that I'm too emotional. So women, some, some of the men find always good reason to think that women are not good at something. Well, and nothing has been proven like this. The only thing that is true is that men cannot deliver babies. All the rest is in, my, in men's mind, right? Sometimes they thought they had no soul, they had no brain, they had no courage, they had no strength, that so they could not run the marathon, they could not go on the moon, they could not, they could not, they could not. It's only in man's mind, right? When we have that in mind, it's much easier. So, so then the question is, how do you move from one situation to the next? And so in 20 years, it took that there were 20% of women as managing director. So there was, anyway, 70% age rates. So we went a program, make your mark, so we have to come to 50-50. And then we did, and then we have 50-50% of managing directors who are women. Regional directors were women, and out of the three biggest country, anyway, two are women. So it is uh, China, US, and Japan, and two are women, and women also grown there, meaning Japanese in Japan. And she's a young woman in a country that values old men. When I came, I was 37 in Japan. My ex co was 65. They say they look me like, like a fresh graduate. Say, say, are you sure that you're the right candidate for it? She is 38 now, and the same for her. And when we think that uh, things can be archaic, quite some time, two years ago there was a big scandal in Tokyo Medical University when the when the board of directors publicly apologized for saying they had been cheating for 20 years of underscoring all women so to have a proportion of 60% boys in medical school. It was in 2019. And for the same reason, they say, well, we, so we have to subsidize, uh, they get married, uh, stop children, and, so, and they're working long hours, and uh, they cannot do, and so, uh, it's, uh, so it's a problem. And say, well, you know, all other countries have gone through that. All have medical uh, women, surgeons, and so forth, and do quite well. So they say, you, it's time for you guys to retire. And they did retire. So this question are still the same. So we have to fight against that prejudice that's still there. So we have moved to 50% and 50, and have 70% of our exco who are women, and we're coming to prepare also them for the next role to be uh, part of the biggest role, because it's, it cannot be it can be promotion, proactive support, but it should not be quota, because at some point quota doesn't work. It has to be competent too. So we have to prepare the pipeline of competent women who are ready to take this job. But we also have to have in mind that women usually bear more obligation than men. In Asia, but basically everywhere, they're supposed to be responsible for kids' education. When you have a parents and a parents and teachers meeting, you know, women find time and men find excuse. You know, it's like that everywhere. Who has to take care about parents? It's usually women. Especially in Asia, women are responsible for taking care of their older parents. So sometimes it's a limit to their mobility at that moment. When there are some questions also about school, and so it's usually you women who feel responsible for it. So we have to put in the system also a thing that is their, 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 their way to run their own life in a way that allows that. Not only to say you are, un you are allowed to do it, but it's making possible with your own personal background and conditions. Otherwise, you know, the entire society will collapse. So it's, it means a lot of things, not only to put the system in place, but also to have a mindset it's, it's good to have this diversity of thinking. And diversity is also a part that uh, changing also to encourage men to accept the part of feminine values that they may have and they were not authorized to show in public. Because men want to show that they are real men, that they are strong, that they are courageous, that they are not scared. But there is nothing like this either. The world is growing to values which are both considered masculine 
competitive, strong, courageous, but also compassionate cooperation and in negotiation, which were more kind of feminine. There is also a need for solidarity and compassion. And it's a global need, it's growing everywhere. So all the management team must have that in a way or another, either by diversity of profile or diversity of thinking and blending. Because, you know, there's nothing to say that uh, women are not strong and not courageous enough. And uh, I can testify that so many times. Uh, and nothing saying that men cannot be sensitive and compassionate. And in the many uh, parts, even the, the Renaissance condottiere, they were warlord and they were patron of the arts and they were very sensitive. And we saw a ballet yesterday where the Tatar uh, warlord is uh, really cruel and then he falls in love for the young girl and then he, he spent the rest of his life in the fountain of tears. Well, I say if you want to, to, to save her heart, don't kill her, her husband and, 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 and her father first. You know, it's more difficult to seduce in this way, but anyway. Anyway, warlords are warlords. But so we can have both, and we have all these values have to come together. So that's the part that we have to understand also that what was masculine and feminine are changing. The values are getting blended. And also for people now, a generation have the right to become and to be who they want to be. Meaning you can be, you are born, you are born with, a, with a biological sex. You can change with science, but it's a bit difficult and, uh, and it's not the majority. But for the rest, and then you can have to grow your identity with the portion of masculine and feminine that you want. Especially for women, it's very broad. So we should not have prejudice on how we project things. But we have to support the cause for women because they are facing more difficulties when they want to get some loans, it's very difficult. When they want to get some credit for many things, they still have a lot of hurdle. And that's where we have taken a very big initiative to be in the Dubai uh, Universal Exhibition 2020. We curate, as Cartier, the Women's Pavilion. It's the first time that in an ex exhibition like this one, there is some thematic pavilion, one about environment, one about education, and what about women. And we are curating it. So it's first a symbol that we are doing coalition in new ways. I thought about Fondation pour l'art contemporain and Trinelle de Milan. Here we collaborate with the Ministry of State and Her Excen Excellency Rima Lachemi. She's a really great charismatic leader, a, a woman. We used to we tend to think that uh, that the Middle East is only kind of archaic in relationship with men and women, but in, in government it's probably one of the most proactive and has gone to a balance and um, and equality in uh, and uh, in parity in the representative. Uh, one of the most influential women in that region, Sheikh Aloubna Al Kasimi from uh, Sharjah. She graduated in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Emirates. She went to the United States in California. She had a PhD. She's super brilliant. She was the first woman as a minister of state on minister of finance and economy and then on culture and then on tolerance. She's not retired. She is really one of the most powerful, insightful, cultured women I've ever met. And she's from Dubai, or I see from Sharjah. So we should not think that, you know, there is something where it's only a question for men. So many problems in there. But many things are moving so rapidly. So I think it's a perfect place to have this kind of pavilion. And we curate it with the theme, which is when women thrive, humanity thrives. So nothing to say, let's have a look on women, either how the world looks on women, but what women can bring to the world in facing the challenge that we have. And so we are strongly committed, and we're sure it will be a lot of talks around. And so if you want to have the occasion to go to Dubai from October to next March, there will be our presence in most a artistic, scientific, sensitive way, and also opening a lot of social dialogues and format. We also want to join the uh, Generation Equality Forum that is will, will gather in Paris in uh, in June, and also to have that forum also come in Dubai to in, in our pavilion. Uh, we were also supporting the uh, the leaders for peace from the f uh, ex Prime Minister Jean Pierre Raffarin, also with the ex. Uh, UN um, Secretary Ban Ki-moon, who tried to gather uh, some uh, still influential diplomats to work about the how to prevent the, the war. And there was one question about the role of women in, in peace, either to protecting peace, because usually they want to go more to allocating, allocating resource. So there have been some statistics, especially in, in Africa. When women are parrots in parliament, they allocate resource first to food and to education and not on weapons. When men are more in charge, I think defense is a key thing, so we have to allocate money on weapons to defend ourselves. 
But when you do that, then you keep the economy low, people have starving, and then they have no other choice than again becoming mercenary. So it is put the cycle of violence. So to stop violence, you have to stop feeding violence with weapons and feed the economy with food, education, and health. So anyway, Coming in this uh, in this part with leader Polape, we'll also have this big forum and fantastic speakers coming because we want we think it's a good occasion to talk about the role women should play in the next coming challenges, which is basically environment, climate change has to go through education and all these part. And also with cardiff philanthropy, we have some very also good example of how something that looks small impact can in fact have a big one. So there is a. Uh, women who have been supporting from uh, quite some time, Safina Hussein, uh, again one of the most uh, inspiring uh, person and woman I've, uh, I've met. She uh, has uh, created a concept for, for rural India where basically girls don't go to education. It's not only high education, they are not just sent to school at all. For about the same reason, meaning uh, if the family is poor, everyone has to work, and if you have to give education, give to the boy, because they will have to carry on the family business. And the girl will married at 13, will become pregnant at 14, give children, and then it's not the problem of the family anymore. Uh, so why giving them education, right? And so, of course, then the cycle of poverty continues, because it's been shown that the more educated women, the more redu reduction of child mortality, of health, of growth, and of and family prosperity. The key economic factor for getting out of poverty are women. It's also what Mikhail Yunus found out with his microfinance, that if you finance women, they develop and they pay you back. If you finance men, some do, and some gamble, and some waste it, and some decide to go to the moon with even with no money. And, uh, and, and so most it's of better it to invest to women startup, not men. So well, it's been a kind of economic fact that the investment on microfinance on women is fine. But if you stay to microfinance, it's a bit limited. And so uh, these uh, economic factors uh, are really important to grow. So this would be uh, the Safina Hussein thought, I have to invest on uh, education in India. Put a concept to convince parents to send their girl, their daughter to school. Giving also at that time food and clothes there, so there's economic merit in doing it. And then keeping them at school. And she started with 5,000 villages, and it worked super well. And then we, and we supported financially to increase to 15,000. And then she got some, some, some support from Skoll Foundation, from United Nations, and from the Indian government, who saw it really works. And she will do an expansion, because she got now $50 million for the next coming three years. And she said, what will you do with it? Well, I will expand to 1.5 million young girls. So from 5,000, her model is expanding to give education to 1.5 million young girls, which probably will make the next generation will be out of poverty. So impact-driven philanthropy is something that really works. And if we work with women on that, we can have really a substantial impact. We've done that with Cartier Philanthropy, Cartier Women's Initiative, and, uh, and on some things that a very basic concept could go to enormous impact and results. So we're really committed in continuing. The next challenge is Dubai 2020. And oh. then uh, I'm sure many other things will come. So I'm, such, I'm launching so many projects that <laughs> you will tell me. Thank down. you very much, Cyril. We're perfectly on time. And uh, I propose uh, to audience uh, participate in some Q&A session. If you have your questions, please raise your hand. And uh, I think we have an additional microphone over there. And I have three daughters. And one son. So, so it's your personal I commitment I'm to womanomics. About, <laughs> about their future. You know, I want to ensure their uh, future for them, which is really bright as well. Uh, there is a good question there. Yeah. Uh, uh, well my name is Ksenia. I am uh, a student of master program management in arts and culture. Firstly, thank you so much for your talk and for your experience. Uh, in, thank you for moderating the conversation. And my question is about the promotion and young audience. Um, now it is very popular um, uh, in um, culture, especially uh, in the Russian music industry, um, to name and force uh, the name of fashion brands. Uh, and um, this story was with Gucci, Fendi, uh, Louboutin, and so on. And now uh, was the same story with Cartier in Russian TikTok. And um, I. <laughs> He doesn't know this story. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
and um, uh, I'd like to ask you uh, how do you think um, uh, if this fact um, helps to promote the brand as uh, the sales are really starting to grow uh, as the example of Fendi in Russia or uh, is it um, negative story for the um, elitism of the brand because um, uh, the image of the brand is uh, starting to crumble in the eyes of the audience? Um, I would say that the first thing in the, uh, in the digital uh, part, there are constantly new uh, forum formats, uh, media coming in. And, uh, and we have to explore them to see, to see what, what they are and what, what they bring. So a few years ago, we say, you know, you need to be careful on uh, Facebook or Twitter or others. And they become kind of part of a general thing. So not only for young people, but for everyone. TikTok is still very young. And uh, on a style which are kind of uh, uh, often not very elegant, or people putting themselves in a uh, in situation, taking video and making fun and thing, uh, in in way which is so far not so much so much linked to luxury, but it depends. So meaning, if you can find an occasion which is which is relevant and can do it in a nice way, why not? I had seen some project of film for our own TikTok from Cartier and I say, this is so banal. Why are you doing that? It's not because it's it's, it's because it's TikTok and I say, that if if you think it's banal, don't do it, whether on TikTok or not. But when we had the Pasha launch in China, and we had a series of, of uh, activation, including TikTok, and but not only TikTok, and, and um, most of them were on WeChat, on uh, Weibo, and it worked super well. We had one billion views on the over-activation program, four million likes, and it made the brand really uh, hot in those minds. So. Uh, whether we have to embrace this kind of a uh, launch audience, I think is yes. But again, do it if you do it with, uh, with, with yourself, being true to who you are. Do something which is nice and strong and you don't feel that you are ashamed of what you've done. So it's more the question of general quality. So I don't know what the TikTok things in Russia. Yes, I, I just wanted to uh, clarify that it's not, uh, in fact, brand project. It's uh, initiative of the guy and uh, uh, nothing special. It's just a song uh, and some uh, like performance uh, mentioning uh, Cartier brand. But it's not something that was produced uh, by brand. And of course, it's absolutely fine. We are free to put any content in social media. And after it's a choice of followers of this uh, person, if it's like, uh, if he likes or she likes it or not. Uh, but that's uh, Marilyn Monroe did the same, you know, when Diamonds are the girl boss friend, she mentioned Cartier. And yes. <laughs> us she was not paid for it. And so it's that it has happened in the past in different, f in different ways. And then to say, where we go on, on TV or so forth in the past, they know TV is not a media for luxury. Now the question is totally relevant. So this question it is the same in physical. Uh, should we go to any place in any city, any shopping mall? The answer is no. It has to be selective. So I have to be where people usually go. We have to be where the real life is, but in a way that can be you. And TikTok is a kind of a evolving uh, material. Um, I think it will be ready with certain uh, certain kind of uh, of, uh, of consideration or, or, or limits. Um, but uh, it's not a major one now. And I think a brand which go, would say we, we all go on TikTok because it's uh, loved by young people would be wrong. Because uh, and you make, can make fun on anything on TikTok. Yes, and uh, as you mentioned, Cyril, in the, in the very beginning, that we don't try to appeal by some fun or some uh, super modern stories. A young generation uh, attracted by iconic design and uh, this is something unique and also uh, by the way young generation they favor brands with a very clear set of values and uh, non-commercial communication and different commitments uh, which brands do in, uh, across the life and uh, social responsibility so uh, I wouldn't say that we play a lot with some uh, super um, um, let's say more than uh, promotion today. Uh, at the same time, we are not arrogant and uh, we're really interested in different initiatives and we like the dialogue which we can build with all the generations and all ages. We, we, are pres we have presence in social media, and uh, but we use all media channels. So TikTok today is not our channel. And, and m my challenge is when with the, uh, with the social media, uh, how to interact uh, well on WhatsApp, online, on WeChat, 
and also someone there something on Instagram and things where you see a lot of comment with many emojis, many heart and 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 flames and and so when I receive some direct comment or saying some heart beating like this, say, how should I re respond to that? And I'm, I'm the president of the company. Is it fine? It's, it seems to be kind of a twenty something youngster send me a lot of this beating heart. If I send the same thing, it will just look ridiculous or kind of a. Of out so of your my reaction mind. should be relevant to so your status. And, and then I use my and so I, I test with my young my, my my children, and they say, Papa, the way you use the emoji is so outdated. <laughs> you don't use this little emoji with that with tear like that at your age. It doesn't work. I say, make me a list, the playlist of the one I can use, <laughs> which you think is relevant for my age. It's a very very difficult new vocabulary to learn. Uh, this being said, uh, I interact on, on all this platform and, uh, and it's very, very nice and I interact on LinkedIn and say yes. posts and, uh, and I do things because this is a new way to have transparent dialogue. So we have to explore and to make mistakes and uh, I have uh, fortunately my reverse mentors uh, tell me, no, don't write this, don't use that, it's not fine for you. And uh, there is an, an interest to Clubhouse, we just discussed it, that it's a new platform, very interesting, because you don't have uh, any visuals, you just talk, and uh, it's something and that and probably so we will use. And so far it's moving a lot, with a lot of, lot of traction, so yeah. we will try some, uh, to, to, to have some rooms on, on interesting topics. Yeah. Thank you for the question. And, and uh, I received the same comment when I tried to buy some things to look cool, I said, no, Dad, this is midlife crisis, stop <laughs> it. <laughs> so, you know, it's the same physically and same for style and for appearance and so forth. So it's good to have children. Uh, thank you. I will continue. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Svetlana. So uh, I wanted to ask you your personal uh, opinion. So uh, we all know that Cartier is open company. And my question is, is like mm, your personal attitude to difference between conservatism and the respect for the past. All we know that you have uh, a lot of collections that are, how we can say, like, you reopen your eyes to them in some years. So how do you think about the difference? Uh, I'm not sure I understood the question because uh, the question is, well, I mean, okay, different I conservatism <laughs> and respect for the past? Yes. I think it's like a little bit different um, things. Yes, I agree. Okay, I, un I understand. So, um, so I said the the respect for the past should not be something which is a, a dusty nostalgia. So we should not be fixed in a period to say we have to just uh, take it as things were and to protect and that's all. It has been to be living heritage, and I think there's notion in Japan about national living treasure. You say you master your know-how and you do it something which is today, and for that I would say the. Uh, uh, being a musician, it's uh, the best source of inspiration ever. Meaning, first you can revisit the past and make it anew, or things have been explored in the past and you make it different. And on that, if uh, and, and same in painting, and so uh, say uh, Picasso has uh, reinterpreted Velázquez and also Manet in beautiful ways. Las Meninas from Velázquez is wonderful, and Las Meninas from Picasso is very nice exploration. It's something which is not a kind of a look at the past to get inspiration for the present to do something different. If you see uh, that um, Shostakovich has reinterpreted Bach in, in, in some way which is very, very literal and then has found some other things. Uh, and also then that the, these two have come to other interpretation in jazz. So you can, you can find you know, the Goldberg variation uh, by Edouard Ferlet or Jacques Lussier which are, or Keith Jarrett which are very interesting. So Inspiration from the past is the best inspiration for the present. So if you think like that, past is a source of inspiration and not something you just protect and do, do to protect in a conservative way, I think it's the most interesting thing to do. And the same for jazz. You know, the, the best jazz piece of the standard have been made for quite some time and you have constantly to look at them with fresh eyes. So the biggest part of creativity is looking at fresh eyes with old things. It's the same in literature. The, n the best stories are the oldest stories, in some way, as far as you can make fresh and relevant. In Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet is a never-ending story you can tell in many ways, like Leonard Bernstein in the 50s doing West Side Story. And the musical is the same story in a different ways. So that's the same also for architecture. If you just look at the past and not stick into that, or even there is a French way of looking at the past which is irrelevant now, trying to see how initially it would have been if things had not changed. 
and that's a bit uh, that's a bit bad. So you know that there was this unfortunate event that uh, Notre Dame burned in Paris, and the, and the old uh, roof burned. And so the question was, uh, should we rebuild as it was when it was made? Should we rebuild as it looked uh, recently? And should we change some pieces like the flesh, which has been done by Viollet le duc in the 19th century? So it was 150 years old, but it was not made for the 11th century. But no one knew which was the original one because there was no plan and design and photos or nothing. And so the modernists, and I'm part of them, say, let's make a rooftop which is according to modern standard. It would not make sense to cut 1,000 oaks, which must be 300 years old each now, to make a rooftop which is so heavy, it's very difficult to do, and no one will see, except when you come inside. When you do that in modern ways of concrete and thing, you can make the same kind of rooftop, the same outside. Inside the church will be the same. You don't see it. It's much lighter and much more environment friendly. So why should we do something that is something a conservatism view of how to reproduce something that has been there for one thousand year but has disappeared? And then for the flesh, let's make a modern one. Ultra modern, like the pyramid in the Louvre by Pay. It brings something different. Why should you stay stick in the past and try to reinvent something in 12th century, which, which we are, everyone has forgotten, or try to replicate the one of uh, 19th century, which was something that we can make Notre Dame modern now, and that will be the only symbol of something so we brought something new now. And that thing would be great. So if we think of architecture, we should think also more about the, uh, uh, the Cathedral of Syracuse, I don't know if you have seen, uh, if you have the occasion to go to Sicily, go and visit the Cathedral of Syracuse. It was a Greek temple, and you can see the column, and you can see the cavea. It's really, you can see the Greek temple. And then to church to a Byzantine church, and you can see the Byzantine church. Then you had some Gothic chapel. And then in Renaissance, there was an earthquake, the facade fell, and it's a Baroque. And you have each, re each uh, century in some way, or period, has added something that make it unique and beautiful. So having a look at the past, try to protect, make it alive, and make it uh, evolve, I think, is our role, and not to get stuck in a period of time that is just in our mind. So living heritage is the same. We have to look at things and to protect them when they can disappear and they are rare, but we should not be stick in that. There is also a very uh, shocking, uh, it's not new now, you know, the, um, if you know the famous photo from Ai Weiwei with three uh, Tang, no, it's a, it's a Han vase from uh, I think 5,000 years old, and he drops it, so you have it in his hand in the middle and crushed on the floor. Um, and then there another one with also the same kind of earthware which has been uh, painted with Coca Cola. And he wanted to challenge our perception of uh, what is art. What are the past? What are the value of things? The value we give to things? Should we protect them or should we protect them and live free with them? The uh, paradox is that the value of his work was so shocking that now it's more, the value of the photos is more than the value of the vase that's been destroyed on the art market value. But at the same time, it's destroyed, something cannot be replaced with 5,000 years old. But he has challenged our perception. What is protecting the past? What in keeping it alive? What is doing something, a new art piece with something old? And can this new art piece can be with the destruction of the other one? And our common answer is it should not destroy, but it can give another life. And if you give another life, it should be okay. We should not have something just stuck of something old because it's old. But at the same time, if we don't have it, it has disappeared. But if we do this with a hologram, with 3D printings and so forth, we can revive things in a way which are unimaginable too. So we have new ways with digital to give a second life to things in a new way. But so to your answer, we should not be conservatist on protecting the past the way we think it was, because we are always wrong, but keeping alive in our memories to keep it a soft inspiration. And I have given this in the podcast, this I say, luxury is a generous propagation of living heritage. We should make it available to everyone on something which stays alive. If at some point it's useless, it's something no one cares for, then it can come to the, you know, the, the memory of history in a, in, a, in a safe. 
But if you want to be part of our life, it has to be living today. Okay? And the last question. I, would, I want to say quickly then to have to. Have to <laughs> and uh, we, c we can collect also questions and after we can send uh, the answers. Yes, please. Okay, so my name is Irina. And um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you for this talk. It was really nice to see, to hear your story, your thoughts. It was really, really nice. So um, my question uh, will be about uh, collaborations. So what are what is the direction of Cartier in question of collaborations? Because, mm, for example, the project with Hermitage you've covered is really amazing thing, and maybe in what direction Cartier is going to uh, continue uh, starting new collaborations? So we're doing collaboration in many ways, and in, uh, in uh, architectural projects or cultural projects, and using some famous designers and things. So we this one with Hermitage was a nice collaboration. We had also the exhibition uh, in uh, Tokyo two years ago in the National Arts Center was curated by Hiroshi Sugimoto, who is a great Japanese artist, photographer, and doing many other things. And uh, he made an exhibition which was just amazing, a piece of art by itself. Uh, in our boutiques, we collaborate with a different uh, architect, and uh, including so Bruno Moinard, Laura Gonzalez, a very strong, powerful, upcoming architect. And she's the one who has designed the project for Moscow, uh, Petrovka. And we have others in, in this way. What we do not do, is we do not collaborate with artists to say, can you do a logo and put that on our bags or or a or, 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 uh, or ring would be a special edition, uh, uh, Zaha Hadid, uh, Anish Kapoor, uh, Murakami Takashi. Uh, we don't do that. We don't need to have, because we think it's an alibi, we can do collaboration with designers if we do something for them or with them, but not something as a co-branding, just to say we have additional value in there, which is very artificial. We don't collaborate with artists to make some decorative elements in the store. We don't put uh, something in the staircase and say, look, I'm contemporary because I have a sense of taste that can bring contemporary art in my store. Then it brings art to only decorative. And that's very poor. Art is more art something shocking, taking your feeling, taking you away. And what we explore with Fondation pour l'art contemporain is either artists which are unknown, artists who are unknown but want to do something different, collectives, and we had a young European generation of artists who was really great, and there were some from Russia and Ukraine, and we do some with young Chinese artists unknown, and also collaboration with art and science and media to do something different, like it was for the Great Animal Orchestra. And this is interesting. You bring something interesting to us. But we don't put just something to hang on the wall in the, in the boutique to say, well, we'll leave with our time. So we don't collaborate in this way. So we collaborate with other institutions, Hermitage Museum, the Fondation pour l'Art Contemporain Triennale de Milan, and there are some other things. Us with the State uh, of Dubai for the Universal Exhibition, and us with the United Nations Development Programme with the Lion's Share, us with United Nations Women for this uh, uh, unstereotype alliance, generation equality, so when one and we are about to make an, uh, a, uh, an announcement next year for uh, a global uh, coalition consortium of brands going to blockchain on luxury sector, um, and it's important to do that because blockchain is a very important technology can have many implication, but it's a young technology and with companies that we don't know what they want to do in ten years from now, the problem of, of startup in high tech is what is your exit strategy. But if we work thing with our data, privacy, and something long-term, like kind of a guarantee certificate, then we must have a guarantee that the technology lasts enough or it's in hands that can make sure that it can continue in the future. That's why we have to structure on our own, but with our colleagues and our friends. And we are joining the Science-Based Targets Initiative for Climate, and we want also to encourage the rest of watch and jury profession to do the same. So another kind of collaboration, cooperation. So this century, century of new coalition, new cooperation, and a new uh, solidarity. But in a way it is relevant and not just a gimmick. Thank you very much. And uh, let's uh, ask a uh, question from that, that from that part, just because there are a lot of hands. Uh, 
Hello, thank you so much for your inspiring talk. Business uh, looks much more interesting when you look at it uh, at <laughs> from the perspective of quantum physics. Uh, and my question is uh, about the last year and how you handled it, because uh, let's admit it, luxury goods are not what you think about first, as a first need um, during the life-threatening situation. And um, so uh, how did you see your mission um, towards your clients and what you were giving to them in these circumstances? This could be quite a long answer, so I will make it short. Don't don't. Uh, be to risk fan. zone. <laughs> so, um, the luxury mission, in some ways, something that looks uh, strange, because our mission is to make all our effort to bring beautiful products people don't need, but they like. So we we are consciously on doing something absolutely useless, right? Don't record it. Don't quote it, but that's 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 how it is. But. Useful things have never made anyone happy. We are happy with things which are useless. Love, culture, friendship, art, sports. When the team wins, you know, when the, when the teams win the World Cup, everyone is so happy in the, in the country. It is absolutely useless. And the tangible object to meet our intangible feeling, which are not serving any purpose, but these kind of things which are human bonding, Celebration, self-esteem, self-reward, status, things like that. Only psychological value that we like to have because it makes our life easier or simpler or more beautiful. So we are striving to make beautiful things that do not serve any purpose other than this one. So when there is a trend for deconsumption, you say, well, isn't it a threat for luxury? Because we have to stop consuming what is useful, useless. I say, no, the problem of deconsumption is that we have to stop consuming everything especially the useful one, water, electricity, everything, food. If all humanity was eating as Japanese do, there would be no food problem. But European eat 30% more than Japanese for the same weight, and American 30% more for European. This has to stop, and we can do. It's just a question of mental shift. So we have to stop consuming everything useful, and then we can have some room from something which are not useful, like art or like culture, or like, uh, like luxury, as far as more frugal, not something opulent and just taken on impulse. So the opposite of luxury is not the consumption, it's instant gratification or something we just buy on impulse and get tired the next day. So we have to make things more durable. And so during the crisis, what we saw, the more people were locked down, the more they reflect on themselves, on who they love and what matters for them and they could not travel to see this one, and so they came more to buy tangible things to express their intangible feeling. And jewelry, which is the most symbolic, came really top of the mind. So fast fashion reduced because, anyway, products could not be in the store, and you didn't have social occasion to go and, uh, and, and show them around. But anyway, there were a lot of purchases at home because it's all something that makes you feel good. There was a, a, a board in a, in a Milan store for shoes, which was saying, you cannot buy happiness, but you can buy shoes. And it's at the end, it's almost the same. And that's true. You know, I know uh, many female friends who have so many shoes in their wardrobe. They're so happy with that. <laughs> and because just buying makes you happy. Even if even you can uh, you know, twist your ankle and so and non-ergonomic, and uh, sometimes I don't know. Very comfortable, okay, good for you. Uh, <laughs> this is more comfortable. Sneakers are more comfortable, but anyway, many shoes are just not ergonomic, not comfortable, but anyway, so sexy and beautiful that we love buying them. So there is this part that's really something making happy. If you're sometimes a bit depressed, going shopping lifts you up, right? Kind of. And so for luxury and jewelry especially, it's been something in the anti-crisis to say, I buy something meaningful for me, I send to the, my beloved one, my, my children, my daughters, my, my partners, my husband, my wife, and to uh, have our bonding. Because anyway, you cannot travel, save money, so there was something very practical too. If you save all the money you had planned for your travel, your hotel, and so forth, what do you do with the money we have? Then you can come to buy your red box, and it's even uh, better than other box, but anyway. So, and you're sure to make someone happy. And because these things are durable, you know you will still love them in five years or 10 years from now. So our mission makes them even more durable. So the role of luxury is also an anti-depressing factor when you have a luxury. And you know today, I feel you, you're more and more smiling. So you say, oh, our business in this way is more interesting. 
than I thought before. Because it's, because it's a part of joy. So we are here to bring beauty and joy to the world. But the new thing in the world is that we have to be anchored in reality. We cannot say we just see an our motor. We see the beauty wherever it may lie. We see it in screws, in nails, in bolts, in anything that can look very mundane and we transform into something more beautiful. But then in this case, we also have to see the world the way it is, with good and bad, and try to act on it to make it slightly better for diversity and inclusion, for equity, for solidarity, for philanthropy and all these things. We have to act on the world to make it slightly better. We have also to act on the world to give it to our children in a better way that they might receive it if we continue with doing nothing. That's a generation commitment that we have to make. But it's not only because we're luxury brand. Everyone has to do it. But luxury brands are more visible. So they have more responsibility to show the way. Even if our impact has nothing to compare with fashion, there's nothing to compare with, with car industry, there's nothing to compare with energy industry. Those doing some coal mining and electricity you know, pollute incredibly more. I guess they pollute in uh, two hours what we pollute in, in an entire year. Nevertheless, we all have to be committed on doing something. And so that's the part where luxury has to change in this way. Otherwise, the next generation will not forgive us. So, or it's a question of say, how do you discount the life of your children, your grandchildren, and the great-grandchildren? But then we probably, at some moment, the great-grandchildren will stop having kids because they say, it's not a world we want our children to live in. So the problem might come to an extent much easier than, than we think, not because of a catastrophe, but at some point human beings will say, let's stop. We don't want our children to face that life. So if you want to give them a chance, uh, we have to... Something positive at the end. But that's why <laughs> if we act now, we have all the way to make it happen in a good way. Love, so solidarity. Yes, and sustainability. Exactly. <laughs> so here we are. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, Sergei Mikhailovich, thank you very much for welcoming us. And it was really a very pleasant tour and also a wonderful discussion with uh, all your colleagues. And uh, I believe that uh, we will find a lot of uh, ideas which we can realize and some projects which we can do in yeah, across uh, functional uh, groups with students. Nothing. We'll Tomorrow is together. Yes, right? absolutely. Thank you very much, Cyril.